Greetings and welcome once again to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. So, in the last video on what is time, part three, we ended off uh, by discussing Earth time. And so, today I'm going to continue a little further on with that and possibly finish, but I don't know if I will, but I'll try. So, in other words, the number of seconds elapsed are always equal to the distance covered at the equator divided by approximately 460, okay? 460 meters. So <clears throat> one second is equal to 463 divided by 463 meters. And in terms of my previous definition, if our measuring device records five intervals of time, five intervals of time, where each interval is a standard second, <clears throat> then we interpret this as five seconds. So that is the time taken for the Earth to move approximately five times, 4, 000, uh, five times 460 meters, which is about 2,300 meters. Okay, so in essence, it is impossible to define the concepts of slow or fast unless we set a standard distance as a, as a reference. So a standard difference is our unit a unit of time, right? In all our usage of time, this frame of reference is the motion of the Earth. Okay, so I think you must have thought a lot about this, but if you haven't, you should stop and think about it. Now, if you have no matter, then you have no time. And whilst matter is necessary for time to exist, whether it's physical matter or otherwise matter, call it spirit matter, let's say, it is not sufficient there must be standard repeatable motion that is constant, okay, almost constant. Nothing in the universe ever stops moving at the subatomic level. From this, we can question whether any motion is standard, and Einstein did not realize that if there are changes in time, then this is due to the fact that no motion is ever truly constant. So to call something time dilation is absurd. But why did not Einstein call it time contraction? It could be either, depending on the distance covered. So rather, the time, anology, time anomalies, so-called quote anomalies, are a change in the standard motion. This is what leads um, to the things, to the uh, observations Einstein made with respect to clocks and to GPS devices. So for example, um, these concepts have nothing to do with the nature of space-time because there is no such thing as space-time. It's a junk concept. And there is no such thing as going backward or forward in time uh, or, or the ridiculous concepts such as ripples in space-time or time travel or any of that other nonsense that you hear so much on YouTube. <clears throat> and uh, so-called scientists, theoretical scientists and physicists are taking you for a ride because you're clicking on their, their ridiculous videos and uh, by so doing, contributing to their well-being so that they can publish even more rubbish. So these phrases, by the way, ripples in space-time and whatnot, are too theatrical physicists as the beating of a drum is to a two-year-old. Time cannot exist in any void, okay? And so I think I've made this clear. And just as Einstein was the father, uh, just as George Cantor was the father of all mathematical cranks, mainstream mathematical cranks, so is Albert Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein the father of all mainstream, math, uh, not mathematical, but uh, theatrical physicists. So uh, the accuracy of a time mechanism, how is that determined? How, how do we determine that? Well, the only logical way is to use Earth time, right? And we can take a, a simple rod, place it in the ground, and mark the tip of its shadow. And then that time will mark or denote zero time units. Then the observation begins to uh, record if the passing of a day will again constant, coincide with a zero time unit. So since the Earth does not rotate at the same speed all the time, there will be a small difference in the distances between the shadow markings for one Earth rotation. So... The actual calibration of a clock device is easy and not important in understanding that any clock device is calibrated according to Earth time. So what is time not? Time is not the indefinite continued progress of existence. 
either of events in the past, present, or future. It's not about the point in time as measured in hours and minutes, because hours and minutes are meaningless in any other context except the context of Earth. Time in physics uh, as measured by a clock, <clears throat> as saying that is what a clock reads, that's absolute rubbish. Okay. A clock reads time units, okay, not time. There is a, a subtle difference here. So all these fake concepts or garbage concepts, as I like to call them, because that's really what they are, have nothing to do with time. They just obfuscate students, they obfuscate people who are trying to understand. And if you go to the, all the common science like that huge shit pile called Reddit or Quora or Wikipedia, you'll see that no one there has any clue what is time. And of course, uh, we can combine time mathematically with any other physical uh, quantities. So then we arrive at notions such as motion, kinetic energy, etc., time-dependent fields, whatnot. So there's also no such thing as linear time. I mean, linear time, it says, is a concept whereby time is seen sequentially. So to summarize then, I think we've covered everything correctly. If you decide that you want to tell me time is something else, you need to be able to define it exactly. Okay, otherwise, anything you say is just drivel. Okay, so you need a definition of time that works for everything. And it's not a, a vague, exotic, ethereal term. It is a very well-defined concept. And in order to convince yourself of this universal truth, which I, the great John Gabriel, revealed to you, try to define time without matter or motion. Just try it. And before you think that I'm wrong, make sure you have such a definition. Otherwise, you're a fool. Good luck. So now, um, the last topic, which I think I will cover in this uh, video, is the garbage about dilation and contraction. So... In science, an experiment has to be relevant. More often than not, experiments have not answered the questions or, in, or adequ adequately addressed the hypothesis. This is especially true in the study of theoretical physics, right? Which better named is theatrical physics. So I'm going to place a link to this article so you can read. I'm just going to cover the main points. Um, Again, before you can answer what is time dilation or contraction, you need to know what is time. And now we've done that so far. And that's the reason I took it upon myself to write an article on what is time, because most theoretical physicists don't know what it is. And it's a good idea to know what you're dealing with, especially if it's the very base concept of all your theory, isn't it? Okay. So now, the first experiment was the Ed Eddington experiment. And it's based on a concept of which we have no clear understanding. That is gravity, okay? It decidedly has nothing to do with time. And loosely understood, gravity is a force of some origin. And my theory is that gravity is caused by matter and motion also. And you may retort that gravity is present between two stationary objects, to which I respond that no object is truly stationary. In other words, they might be <clears throat> stationary with respect to each other, but they are moving. Everything in the universe is moving, and that's why there is gravity, uh, even at the smallest size. So now, by the way, this is just my theory, and I'm not a physicist, so, and I do not claim that my views are provably right. However, they are also not provably wrong, okay, because you don't know what gravity is. No scientist knows what it is. Einstein didn't know what it was either, but he produced a uh, a ton of theory that's just a load of BS. So aside from the experiment being based on an ill-formed concept, there are possible reasons for the light bending phenomena of the Ed Eddington experiments. And one of them is an optical illusion. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm a mathematician, so it's possible my opinions are not correct, but my IQ is above 160. IQ, Einstein never had an IQ test. Did you know that? Yet every Tom, Dick, and moron claims he had one of the highest IQs. That's just pretty amazing. And not that IQ means much, but there you have it. If you want to throw any relevant claims about Einstein's intelligence, the end result is always nonsense. By the way, I don't think Einstein was stupid, but I can tell you right now he was no genius. 
not even close. Because how do I know? Because I'm a genius and I would know another genius. He wasn't a genius. So let's look at the Haffel, or however you pronounce it, Haffel Keating experiment. And this one concerns those clocks, those, those two apparently accurate atomic clocks. And one question that immediately arises in my mind is, can any clock be accurate in its measure? So what does accurate mean in measure? Can accuracy be, be quantified meaningfully? It turns out that it depends more on perspective than science. So in the physical world, there is always error in measure. Therefore, scientists attempt to measure accuracy in terms of error. This process is like the robberies. It's entirely circular. For in order to talk about error, we must first determine what it means to be accurate. So you might say accuracy is based on constantness, but then it's quite clear that the motion of the universe, in particular that of the Earth's rotation, is anything but constant. Okay, It's almost constant, constant, but it's not constant. So there's no accurate standard, and the time, anom time anomalies of such small magnitudes are of such small magnitudes, so how can anyone claim they are significant? And I don't care if you've got a predict predictive function and it's close. It doesn't prove anything about these time, anom time anomalies. And the Heffel Keating experiment didn't prove that time dilates or contracts. Yes, I believe there is a difference in readings, but I'll get to that in a second. So the time anomalies notice are a result of the change in almost constant speed of the Earth and other objects. So if you study the object, the illustration below, excuse me, there are two clocks, A and B, which measure time units according to Earth time, right? Each 463 meters covered equals a second. However, clock B <coughs> is aboard a spaceship <coughs> traveling at 600 meters per second. So if the Earth moves through 4,630 meters, it would take the Earth approximately 10 seconds on clock A. On the other hand, for clock B to cover the same distance, it would take 7.71 seconds. And so that's approximately 4,630 divided by 600. So if the two clocks start out at the same time, it's pretty obvious that the clock on the faster object will show less time elapsed over the same distance. Nothing suspicious yet. It will show less time. Uh, it will show less time. Okay. So why do clocks in space have to be synchronized with clocks on Earth? Because the almost constant speed of the Earth means that each rotation will not occur in the same time. Therefore, Earth time is not exact. It's what I've always been telling you in all these uh, videos, that the Earth's motion is almost constant, but not exactly. So both clocks work on a constant calibrated Earth time which, as I said earlier, is one second is equal to 463 meters divided by 463 meters. And this is what causes the time anomalies, not the nonsense of time dilation or contraction or the curvature of space-time or the ripples in space-time or any of the other Hollywood bullshit that you hear mainstream the theatricals physicists talk about because that's really what they are. They don't understand time. So in order to draw any sound conclusions on time change, we need clocks that are calibrated precisely to Earth time. There is no such clock. Not even atomic clocks are calibrated precisely to Earth time. We attempt to cali calibrate them precisely or as accurately as we can, but they're never calibrated exactly, even if it's an atomic clock. Thus, since we cannot draw any sound conclusion about Einstein's questionable claims, one of two options must be correct. A is that his theories must be the right theories because he was a genius <laughs> and less immortal simply cannot understand, or because his theories are nonsense and they are beyond rational explanation. So I think I did finish this series in time. And just as a conclusion, a time change implies that m measures change, which is a paradoxical, paradoxical statement. Time change implies that measures change, okay? Measures change, which is paradoxical, because if the magnitude being measures changes during measure, then how reliable can such a measure be? Stop and think about that. Read this paragraph a few times to understand it, okay? 
Now, if clocks could calibrate on the fly for each small change in the Earth's rotational speed, then there would never, in theory, be any difference in measure between the clocks. Never. That time can be dilated or contracted is, is as absurd as it sounds. It makes no sense because it's nonsense. Okay, so I'm going to stop here now, finish with the time series. If you're not already a subscriber, become one. Click like because I am persecuted. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. It's, it's a fact that I've been persecuted all these decades by evil mainstream academics, especially the mathematics ones. Tell your friends about this, follow me on academia, and contribute a few dollars if you're able. My name is John Gary. Till next time, goodbye.